Aloha. Good morning. Good afternoon. Or good evening. You can you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to the United States and become an American. Welcome back to a nation of immigrants, a bi-weekly talk show program featuring the lives, diversity, inclusion of the immigrants. This show has been produced by Think Tank Hawaii and the Kingsfield Law Office. Today, we are thrilled to have our good friend, Bobak Hai Eri. Today, we, you are really in for a good treat because Bobak her high area, my apology, and it's a really important immigrant. He is a uh, he born in Canada to Persian parents. He moved to the United States as a young man who he served 15 years in Bakerfield before getting his degree in international relations from the University of Southern California. He's been a movie and music video producer, taught high school sex education for Planned Parenthood and trained as a labor organizer. He went back to school to get his law degree from the University of Minnesota, where he is an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota Honors Program and teaches lawing skills. His legal work has covered FBA regulatory issues Tours, copyrights, trademark, and as well as business startups. He also researches and lectures on modern architecture in Minnesota. He's a member of the Football Writers Association of America, and he reports and hosts an interview show on college football. That's a very, very interesting, you know, bio about Bach. Thank but you. My fourth great, well, thank you. Welcome again to our show. I've been, you know, trying to uh, schedule our show for a long time. And you, when I, when we started this uh, a nation of immigrants show, you are one of the first people we want to interview. And uh, first of all, I have many questions for you, but please tell us where are you right now. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be on the show, and I wanted to thank you for for letting me join you and, and talk about my experience. Um, but before we get to that, yeah, no, so um, thank you for being accommodating. Today, uh, when we're recording this, is the college football national championship at the top level. And that game is being held here in Los Angeles. So um, it's being held in about four hours and 30 minutes from now. So I'm just unplugging. I'm in the press box. Um, you can see. and Wow. Yeah, so I am currently perched. Uh, above the field in the in the press box, so thank you for your patience on that. Now that I got that plugged in, but yeah, no, they're, everyone's slowly getting ready to cover that, and it's one of the the hats I wear is I occasionally cover college football, which is one of those things that I guess is part of the uh, the experience and what what brought me to what what I enjoy about living in the United States. Thank you so much. That's that's very very cool. Uh, I believe people should have multiple identities. And that's why you are my favorite guest. You have multiple identities. Talented people are hard to define, and you are hard to define. Obviously, you are a lawyer, and you are a reporter, and you are a teacher. But uh, let's start with your childhood. How did you get here? And what your childhood looked like? You were born in Canada, and when did you uh, started to become Bobak as today's Bobak? Boy, that's a great question. So when um, when I I was as I mentioned, I was born in Toronto, Canada. Um, my parents had been immigrants multiple times. Um, they were both born in Iran, and they moved to England independent of each other. My mom went to boarding school there and uh, stayed there. And my dad was already a physician and went to do more postdoctoral work um, at the University of Liverpool and then stayed. So they met at the embassy in London because my mom's uncle was a charge d'affaires at the time. 
And then from there, uh, they married and eventually moved to Canada, where my dad was again pursuing even more additional postdoctoral fellowships to then um, settle in Toronto because they wanted, they're working in a big city. So after I was born, they, uh, they moved to a small town called Stratford because they wanted to make sure it was a, a more um, family friendly environment, they thought. Um, and I think that's actually something a lot of immigrants think, like the smaller town, the more family friendly, standardized Americana, rather than staying in a large metropolitan area like a Toronto. And unfortunately, at the time, I, as an infant, did not deal with cold very well. So for my first several years of my life, I was getting sick all the time. So they decided to go somewhere, hopefully a little warmer. And my dad at the time was a very in-demand professional. So he applied all over Southern California. and got offers in many places to practice. And from there, at age three, he selected, when I was age three, he selected Bakersfield, the armpit of the state of California, mm -hmm. where I would say were my formative years. As I like to joke, I served 15 years in Bakersfield um, before going on to college. And then, uh, I mean, my family is still there. So I have a small family. Right now, it's just my mom. But um, so it, that, that I'd say my formative years were growing up in Southern California, but specifically Bakersfield, which compared to some of the folks I've met um, of similar ethnic background in other cities, well, people from Bakersfield, we assimilated a lot faster because there were fewer of us and it was just a, a bit of a harder city if you weren't of the, I would say, the predominant ethnic groups. Thank you so much for sharing stories. Lovely. Uh, you... You were born in the uh, in Canada, so you you are dual citizens. Yes, yes, Canada and United States. And well, I actually have a funny story about that. I yeah, didn't naturalize. Please. I was so lazy because I, I really adapted being the American mindset. I didn't uh, naturalize until I was twenty five, and actually twenty six. Maybe I was out of law school by that point. Really, ironically, my citizenship interview was a guy I went to law school with, uh, <laughs> who was working for I and I. Well, I think it was. Do I say it? Homeland, I, it was Homeland Security at the time, but yeah, whatever yeah. it was. But I just remember when I walked in, he's like, this is going to be a really fast interview. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. We, we, we are lucky to have you uh, in Minnesota and in the United States. Well, so you grew up, you as an immigrant kid, you grew up in Canada, in Toronto and the suburb. So uh, were you hanging around with a lot of immigrant kids? You know, not really. I would say, particularly because Stratford was actually a smaller town, a little bit out of Toronto. It's its own little town. They're known for their little Shakespeare festival because they like to be like Stratford on the dawn, you know, in uh, mm -hmm. in London. But um, moving to Bakersfield in particular, because uh, we weren't in Stratford for too long, but in Bakersfield in particular, I would say we always had a, a mix uh, who we who my family would integrate with or who would, would socialize with. So some were the Persian community, um, and that's understandable, particularly there were a lot of Persian doctors at that time who had immigrated, a lot oh. of professionals. I'm sure engineers too, but there weren't as many in, in, in the circles we hung out with. Although in Bakersfield, there were a few because it's an oil uh, hotbed. So we had a few petrochemical engineers who happened to be also Persian, uh, more Iranian. And... Um, and then from there, you know, as the community grew, there were more business oriented people who ran businesses, a couple of car dealership guys. But I would mm -hmm. say it was always an even mix, although and I think this is something that you get when you're a transplant, even within a country, uh, especially a larger country like the United States. Like I moved from California to Minnesota 20 years ago, and I've always noticed the couples that I hang out with um, predominantly at least one or both were also transplants to Minnesota. Um, like my, my very good friend, he's from Minnesota, but sh his wife is from New York city. So you, you get a bit of, you get a bit of that kind of mix. So all that said, my parents being who they were and having lived around the world already a bit, I think they had already been able to, and also I should say my mom's side of the family was very, my mom's father was a poet and, uh, he oh. uh, was the head archeologist of the Persopolis. So he was always entertaining when it was the Shah, whenever they bring the royal families that would visit the Shah to Shiraz to see the Persopolis, oh. he would always lead the tour. And it's really funny because they weren't always like some European royal family. But my favorite was when I was a child, she showed me a picture. This is the king of Russia. And then as, when I was older, I'm like, there was no Russian king. It was Brezhnev. Uh, <laughs> so, oh. so, yeah, it was so they were used to mixing with, with all kinds of people. So when I moved to the United States, 
you know, a lot of people compared to a lot of folks who are Persian would always confuse us um, because mm -hmm. we don't quite look or sound like what I think preconceived notions are. When my parents met in London, even though it was an embassy of function at the Persian, the Iranian embassy, they were introduced to each other as Italians, like Nima Haye, <laughs> Dr. Hayeri and Nima Tavlali, you know, <laughs> rather than, than Persians. And, and, and consequently, one of my favorite questions I get when I meet other Persians is they then ask me, oh, which half, you know, which half mm -hmm. of me, you know, and I'm like, well, both, you know, both. so, uh, you know, it, it's kind of I, a funny thing. I, it's, I love it. I love it. What, what language did you speak at home? Oh, English. I tried Farsi and I never took to it. I'm, I'm awful with foreign languages. I joke <laughs> that I speak one and a quarter language and that quarter is made up of a mixture of Spanish, Farsi and like a little bit of Japanese. Mm. Well, next question. Uh, so you are teaching the most popular course at the Uni University of Minnesota. And my question to you is why are you classes so popular why they are so you know when I, i'm teaching too and all my students almost single every single one of them we talk about you you know you, you do you know professor bobag uh hi airy so of course we went to law school together and then i have that oh he's a totally fantastic you know tours you know adventure just uh, well i can uh, uh, understand learning skill and can be fun but not that fun Tell us what's your secret, make your course so successful? That's a great question. So I think I got lucky in, in two factors worked in my favor um, and two things that perhaps are, are somewhat inherent to what I teach. Number one, especially now with the law school class, I give it a pass because it's a mandatory class. So people have to be in it. But the undergraduate class, people have to want to take it. So I, I teach, you know, and, and law is always a popular course. Um, I enjoy the teaching law, I enjoy torts, which is the course I teach, civil wrongs. And when I first taught the course, I taught it in a way I would like to be taught to. And I think that's what it boils down to. You respect your students. I, I, I always, the way I like to always open my class is I tell these undergraduates, and you know, some of them are anywhere between sometimes even 17 all the way up to 22. I tell them, you know, I know more than you do, but I'm not smarter than you. So what I'm going to do over the period of the semester is try and get you, you closer to me. And I think they appreciate that. And just talking to them like, like normal people and, and making class fun, I think that's an important thing without necessarily denigrating the material. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I, got, I, I, I like talking to people. I like talking to students, um, especially undergraduates who are full of life. Law school, by the time I get them, it's hit them a little bit hard. You know, it's been yeah. bad. they've got that first punch. But by the time I, I, I love dealing with undergraduates and, and they give me life and I think we feed off of each other. So I think that helps. So I think what makes a class popular is so many people are interested in law. And, um, and luckily, I guess I have a knack for talking to them at a level they appreciate. You, you always have a very long waiting list. You know, it's, uh, it's very hard to get into your class. I don't think I can even get into, you know, it's always, the wait list is always full. And uh, both you and I teach the undergraduate honors program, which mm -hmm. is supposed to be the best of the best students, street A students. Otherwise, you cannot get into the honors program. And uh, in my class, I don't, I see very few immigrant students, international mm -hmm. students. How many international students or immigrant students you have, say that the first generation or second generation? in your classes? Well, first I should say, your class is also very popular because I hear you're about it as well. I was very jealous of your topic because you were more eminently qualified to teach it than I ever would be as a graduate of the, the renowned Beijing Film Academy. But uh, at the same time, um, so but enough of me, I, I apologize. I'm gonna go back to your question. So I would <laughs> say I, I have, gosh, and I think some of it is a product of the demographics of the University of Minnesota itself. Although it does have a very large international student body, I think a number of them tend to be in the graduate programs rather than the undergraduate. And in the under honor system, I would say typically out of a class of 19 or 20, I would get maybe one per semester, sometimes two, oh. sometimes none, but an average of one. And I've always wondered if that is more product of the demographics that draw upon 
when they're building the undergraduate student body from the population of the state of Minnesota. Mm. Yeah, very similar uh, to my class. Thank you for answering the question. Uh, now you are in the bigger field, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your reporting work. How did you end up as a reporter and a, co- a college football reporter and a host? Yeah. <laughs> That is a great question, because that isn't something that people look at me and think that I cover. Um, Most people ask me if I'm a musician, they don't expect that I cover college football. Uh, And those are just, you know, funny things, how things work out. I, when I went to high school, didn't really care about sports that much because I think of my parents. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon. He had to fix people who broke themselves up. So he said, you know, don't do the contact sports, son, do something else. And I was a fat kid, so it made it easy for me to just find video games, I guess. But I was good at theater, I was good at debate, I was good at all those things that in some ways end up naturally leading to perhaps law as a profession. And then from there, um, what happened was I chose my college, and that's what changed everything. I ended up going, staying, staying, staying fairly close to home, two hours away. I moved down to Los Angeles and went to the University of Southern California, which is a very major football power, historically. It always is. I mean, mm-hmm. this very year, we won the Heisman Trophy. We me like I did anything, you know, but the, the school won the, 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 the MVP player. So I was always a good sport when I would go to school events. If it was popular, I'd give it a try. Um, and I remember I went to my first game and I'm like, this is amazing. I had no idea who the other team was. They were Florida State. They were exceptional. But at the time, I was naive to all of this. And then I got hooked. So then as a lawyer, over time, I realized, you know, skill set we learn in law, how to actively listen how to ask questions, how to um, put together a story, especially if you're writing a brief, the fact pattern is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Um, And that ability to write that in such a way is something, and I've known several journalists who had started in the field uh, of of law as well. Um, And I decided, you know, maybe that would be something that would translate well, and it did. And um, so far that has been something I've enjoyed since 2015. And then, um, Gosh, last year we decided to add an audio portion to it. And again, I think I'm uh, somewhat fortunate to have a voice that's good for radio and a face that is somewhere in between TV and radio. Mm-hmm. So I was able to uh, to get a, a few colleagues of mine who helped me with the college football stuff to join in. And we were able to make it serious. I mean, we were able to bring on guests of all stripes, head coaches, athletic directors, um, other reporters. And it's been something that has been, uh, I always joke, I take, my, I take my hobby very seriously. I treat it like a job. And, and that, again, leads me to this, the national championship game, the highest possible level of any football game you can cover in the college football field. And this is my third time covering it. Very cool. Thank you so much. You know, I'm not a sport guy, and uh, I know little about sport. And my colleagues uh, stopped uh, inviting me to the Timberwolf and the Twins games after they figure out that I'm completely ignorant of all the basics. So, but I admire people who are really, really, you know, into the sports. But now let's turn to your uh, your other side, your other identity. And you went to USC, one of the best film schools in the United States. Honestly, when I was uh, after graduate from college, I applied for graduate school at um, and I, USC, NYU, and a few other you know film schools. And I got admitted by NYU, but uh, I got rejected by oh. USC. And so, so I'm pretty upset about that. But anyway, then both you and I went to pretty good film schools, and you are still very much into film. So uh, my question to you is, who is your favorite filmmaker, film auteur? That's a great question. I mean, I, I've always wondered if my answer to this is a bit of recentism, but I, I like two directors in particular. Um, I like Wes Anderson a lot. I always like his style. I like his mise-en-scene, his ability to kind of assemble beautiful sights and, and an interesting uh, uh, complete package. But also, uh, Dennis... Uh, I'm going to butcher the name, but Dennis Villeneuve, uh, the you know the, the 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 director of such films as Sicario, Arrival, Dune, mm-hmm. uh, Blade Runner. I love his vision. I love the fact that he is so seriously committed to making things not only blending digital and and and, and real, but his commitment to telling a story and his his resistance to falling to some of the easier 
pop culture things that some people, some directors do and, and kind of lessen the impact of the film. He really commits, I think, to the complete production. And I'd say it, right now, it, those two are the ones I tend to gravitate the most and I will see anything they make. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And who is your favorite author, shall we say, or intellectual or writer? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So as far as authors are concerned, I, I have a great variety and I appreciate a great variety. I mean, I, I tend to, to gravitate towards, gosh, Shakespeare is probably the best. I, I, feel, I, was, I feel silly kind of defaulting to that, but I felt like he's the one who gave us so much of the fundamental approach to drama in, in the modern sense and the complexity of emotions. And, and fully rounded personalities and characters that so much of what we do now is owed to him and both as a playwright and as a, a literary you know figure mm. well i am a little bit surprised to hear the answer and it's shakespeare so i now i'm going to 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 try to wonder if you are actually a conservative uh, masquerading as a liberal <laughs> <laughs> you know, if uh, you give us a, you, when we were in law school together, you led this bar review, right, every week. And you have this poster all over law school in a bar review. And it, 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 it's a pong. You know, when we talk about the bar in, the, in law school, we mean the, the, the lawyer's bar, but actually you mean bar. <laughs> the pong. Yes. Yeah. And drinking review. It was fun. I, I didn't, uh, I think I went uh, one of, only once the bar review. You guys drink too much. You know, it's, uh, I, I, I can't do that. And, and, but uh, it's very fond of memories. Oh, I really, you. really appreciate you, 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 you took the initiative. Now we are getting to the end of our show. The time just flies. Mm -hmm. But we always end our show with two generic questions to our distinguished guest. One is if time travel permitted, if you were to give some advice to yourself in your 20s, what would you say? To yourself, a younger you, Bobak. Oh gosh, if I were in my early twenties, giving myself advice, I'd tell myself to have more fun. I would do so many more things that I than I already have done, and I did a lot of things. And you went over it quite well at the introduction to the show. But well, your early twenties are your opportunity to go and do things and do more things because things like law school, things like graduate school, they'll always be there. But uh, that youth and that freedom you have, that it's something where I would travel more. Um, I'd probably end up traveling a lot more and, and trying to maybe perhaps even a few more things than I already had. Thank you. Very wise. And uh, the second question is, is there any particular book, article, movie, documentary you are enjoying at the time you really, really want to share with our, our audience? That's a really tough question. <laughs> now. I would say, gosh, oh, I mean, I don't read as many novels as I would like. So I'm a more of a, a newspaper reader, an avid newspaper reader, New York Times, anything else I can grab my hands on. So I almost tell people, like, if you really want to, to broaden your mind, if you really want to become a fully formed person, pick a good newspaper like a Wall Street Journal, New York Times, L.A. Times nowadays but you know pick something like that and just read it consistently for several months if you don't mm -hmm. already do that because if you can do that you'll find yourself broadening your mind and finding yourself and uh, not just in whatever you know niche you're in now but allow yourself to broaden yourself as a human being and, and learn more about what's going on and i mean every section read it all just so that you have a better more complete understanding of how the world works thank you very nice I have one question only for you. And this question is very profound and really eager to hear your answer. Where we are going, what's your prediction for 2023 going forward? I listened to Ian Bremer and uh, Pri Barara yesterday. And uh, then I read a lot of uh, uh, pundits, uh, political pundits, economic analysts. I think that generally speaking, people are pretty pessimistic. And some people even prepare for a nuclear war or an economic collapse uh, in certain parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And that if China collapse, it will bring the war down, the economy down. Yes. And if Russia you know, collapse, and it definitely will have some consequences, some of 
desire, some of not desire. And I'm not going to put you in a position to say something and to uh, analyze something very particularly sensitive. And But I do want to hear from intellectuals because I think the intellectuals are the backbone of the nation. I don't totally trust the politicians. I don't totally trust the uh, financial analyst, but I trust intellectuals. So I want to hear your thoughts on the current affairs and your prediction on where we are going in the coming years. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I personally am not a cynic in a lot of ways. I am an eternal optimist. So what I think is things don't always miss, but at the same time, it's, it's moderated. I don't think things go as bad as people expect or as good as people expect. I think things even out. Now, obviously, we're dealing with terrible things like war, like uh, definitely economic uncertainty. And I do think the economy is going to certainly dip a bit. But I think all in all, things end up more or less staying the same and gradually getting better. That's my hope. I think when you actually look, sure, there's, there, you know, things go up and down, 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 but they slowly kind of keep going upwards in a trajectory. So I think when I, whenever I look at things, whenever I talk to students about the future, I always encourage them to feel that there is a reason for optimism and a reason for uh, to be, to keep playing the game, to keep being part of it and, and being, um, uh, being encouraged that things will go well and, and to be patient. That's a good advice. That's definitely, that now I know why your students love you. So you, you, you're always in, uh, attentive, very thoughtful, considerate, and always encourage the students to maximize their potentials and keep a very positive attitude toward their lives and toward the world. Really appreciate that. Well, we are ending our uh, show just right on time. Again, we have our good friend, Bobak Hayeri, lawyer, lecturer, reporter, live from Bakersfield, live from Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Los Angeles to joining us. I really appreciate uh, your, your time. And uh, what a wonderful American story. And even you are dual citizen. But uh, uh, I, I think that, that uh, finally you have the opportunity to uh, interview our favorite immigrant. Uh, thank you so much for everything, Babak. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasant conversation and I enjoyed it so much. Well, good luck with your reporting and enjoying the game. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, take care. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.